right, so welcome back also to people that are watching it on Moodle or the people that are watching it on YouTube. Um, last part of today's lecture. So I think we have another 50 minutes left. Still have 12 slides. So I think we will be done a little bit earlier today. All right, so the applications, I already talked about this a little bit, um, but many statistical models or many statistical tests, they assume that you have a normal distribution in either the input or in the error term. So after fitting some parameters. So for example, the Shapiro-Wilkes test of normality can tell you if your distribution is a normal distribution. So it is built into R. So if you have a vector of numbers, um, then you can use Shapiro test Give it your list of, or give it your vector of numbers, and then it will give you a p-value saying that it is this likely that your distribution is a normal distribution. Besides that, you have the D'Agostini k-squared test is a goodness of fit normality test based on sample skewness and sample kurtosis. So it's provided by external packages. So if you have a normal distribution which is still kind of normal but has a certain skew or a certain kind of kind of kurtosis then this test can even tell you if the the distribution that you have is good enough to do a certain um, statistical test so r because it's about statistics and hey, it's the language for statistical computing um, the advantage of having a normal distribution is, is that it's a more powerful test. So you get more statistical power um, when your distribution is a normal distribution. And that, this is just because if the distribution that you have is normal or... Um, <laughs> DJ Agostino turned up. <laughs> but no, if it's, uh, so if, it's, if, it's very, uh, if it's a normal distribution, then you get more statistical power because the underlying assumptions of the test, they are true. Um, so that means that you can use a more powerful statistical test instead of having to switch to non-parametric testing, um, which generally uses the rank of the numbers and not the real numbers. So hey, it, 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 it has a little bit of a, a drawback of being forced to use uh, non-parametric statistics. All right, so a little bit about plots. We are going to have a whole lecture about plots and making them beautiful. That will be not next week, but the week after that. And if everything goes well, we will also have a guest lecture for like 30 minutes to an hour. And uh, Misha, a friend of mine, will talk about his um, work where he uses R to create real-time plots to measure um, closed ecological systems. So a closed ecological system is a tube, um, and in this tube there is water, and there are plants, and there are little animals, and this system is at an equilibrium, or that, that is the goal, to keep this system at an equilibrium. Of course, keeping it at an equilibrium is not good enough because you want to add energy to that system to produce food. And um, his final goal is to have a closed ecological system which produces more or less net food or net energy so it can be used on things like space travel. And you can imagine that if you are on a spaceship to Mars, um, then of course eh, during the six months that you're traveling you need to grow your own food, but you want to do this in a, in a, in a closed ecological system because of course eh, you, you don't want any outside interference to it. So he uses R um, together with um, Ardunios um, to kind of measure this system in real time and then create plots and um, see what's going on. So hey, he measures things like CO2 and he will tell you much more about it. So if everything goes okay, then next week we'll have the week off because it's um, a holiday. And then on the 20th, um, we will have first a lecture about plots. So everything about plots and then Misha in the end to talk to you about his uh, work on creating, um, well, real time updating bar plots and graphs and these kinds of things. But in R, creating a plot can be done using the plot function, which of course is very logical. Um, so what the plot function does when you call it with a vector of numbers is that it creates a plot window 
and it figures out based on the numbers that you gave it what the range of the data is so the minimum value the maximum value and it will put this on the y-axis and then on the x-axis it will just be one to the number of numbers and then it will create this dot plot of the measurements that you put in so if you want to add for example a second vector of numbers to an already existing plot you can use the points function so the plot function does nothing but set up the window because it looks at the numbers that you input and then it calls points on your values that you create so the points function is a little bit a misnamed function because it doesn't just create points it also can create lines and um, stair plots and all kinds of other plots um, but it is the main plotting function in R so it allows you to put points or lines or these kinds of things on a plot window and to visualize your data if you create your own plots then you can also use the axis function so the axis function allows you to define what is visible on the x-axis so hey, the side for the x-axis is one the y-axis of a plot is side number two then you have side number three which is the axis on the other side of the y-axis so that's generally called the z-axis and then you have also side equals four and that's the opposite of the x-axis so on the top of the plot generally you don't use side number three and side number four but sometimes you want to create a plot um, which has like a double axis system so it has a y-axis and it has a z-axis on the other side because you want to visualize two types of data one being in a range which you plot on y and the other type of data being in another range which you then plot on the other axis so there's two more parameters there's the add parameter which says at which points you want to have tick marks and then you have labels and these are the labels that are put at the different um, at positions right so you can say um, axis side is one so on the x-axis at one so at the position number one take a label for example genotype a or whatever you want to put there um, when you create plots you also have to create a legend to explain what the different size and colors and shapes of dots mean so you can use that you can use the legend function for that um, the plot window of course is a 2d window um, but the image function is there to create kind of a heat map function so if you want to have a plot which is completely filled like a nice heat map um, then you can in R use the image function and that creates kind of a 2d plot of your data so if you have a data uh, which is just a matrix filled with numbers then you can call the image function on it and then what it will do it will take the x-axis um, from the x and the number of columns will be the y-axis and then hey, it will based on the value in the matrix will then assign a color to it so the assigning of colors in the image function uses the breaks function so the breaks function sets different color boundaries so you can say um, all numbers between 0 and 1 are white all numbers between 1 and 3 are for example blue and all numbers which are 3 or higher uh, get a color which is purple right so you can define for each break so for each more or less a section of your data you can decide which color to use of course you don't have to do that you can also just use the standard image function um, so the plot function is for more or less 2d plots when you have an x and a y measurement um, the image function if you, have, if you have a matrix of measurements and you want to visualize all of them using a nice color scheme and then you can use the breaks so there are some types of specialty plots um, for example like the box plot um, so um, here we have the guinea pig tooth growth um, so here we can see different dosages of vitamin C and then here we see the length of the guinea pig tooth um, you can also use a level plot for heat maps yes yes you also have level and you also have contour which creates these nice contour plots um, which look like a um, a weather map right on a weather map you see like high pressure area low pressure area and that is done using contour so the contour function um, and indeed um, you can use a level plot to create heat maps as well and you can use the heat map function as well although I don't really like the heat map function because it is um, it's a little bit obtuse so it's not as flexible as using the image function but using the image function compared uh, combined with st stuff like a contour um, looks really nice so if you have like a, a height map yeah, so you have for example you're doing uh, measurements of um, 
of, of an area and you measure how high a certain area is, then it's really nice to have a heat map to do things like colors, like everything below a thousand meters is green, everything between a thousand and two thousand is, uh, is brown, and everything above that is white. I don't like the heat map function as well. No, I, I, I don't like it at all because it messes with the margins and it, it's not flexible in, in any case. So I always try to use the image function. Uh, the only saving grace of the heat map function is, is that it provides automatic built-in clustering. But who needs that? You can cluster your data yourself using any clustering function and then just reorder it. So yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the heat map function. Although the heat map function, it does have this really nice dendrograms on the side. And you also have like this ability to do like a little color based on um, the group of which the data is in. All right, so hey, box plots are a very specialized type of plot. So you generally don't want to make them yourself. So there's the box plot function in R, which allows you to create box plots. Um, this is a experiment um, on guinea pigs and how the teeth of guinea pigs grow. Um, and here you see the length of the tooth um, according to different, um, different vitamin C dosages on the one axis. And then you see that vitamin C is done, um, is given using ascorbic acid or just orange juice. And you see that indeed hey, when we look at the box plot we see that um, giving guinea pigs orange juice um, is good for the teeth um, or at least the teeth grow larger um, but only in a certain dosage of vitamin C. We see that for example here between the two groups there's no real difference. Here we also see that there's no real difference and we can see that from the notch. So the notch is something that you can set in the box plot function. So you can say notch is true or notch is false. Um, but when you set the notch as being true, it shows you this um, kind of cave in on the side of the box plot, right? And this is more or less the standard um, standard error in in the measurements. So when you have two groups and the notches do not overlap, then there is a significant difference. When the notches overlap, so you see here that this notch includes this notch, so there's no significant difference between these two groups. There is also no significant difference between these groups. So it allows you to very quickly visualize your data and give people an idea of what is significantly different and what is not significantly different without even using a statistical test. Um, one of the other parameters for the box plot that you can set is the far width and that means that the width of the box plot, so the, the, the bulkiness of the bot plot, is um, based on the number of observations in the group. So if you have a very low number of observations in a group, then you will have a very skinny box plot and if you have a large number of observations in the group, you will have a very fat box plot. So hey, you can kind of add this additional data to the plot. What is the difference between whisker and box plot? It's it's called a box and whiskers plot. So the box, of course, is this is this yellow part, and then the whiskers are the things that are outside. You also see an outlier here, right? So it also plots the outlier, so the the the, the measurements which are uh, which are outside of the whiskers, um, and the whiskers are chosen in such a way that they generally represent two standard deviations. Although you can you can set that yourself. You can say I want whiskers which are uh, three standard deviations or five standard deviations away. Uh, the general box in the box plot is one standard deviation. So uh, like 50% of data falls into the box and then another like um, uh, well 22.5% is in the whisker and other 22% is in the op to upper whisker and then if, if there are data points which are outside of that then they are shown as individual dots and those are generally considered the outliers. So two things that you can add. The notch the notch automatically makes this cap, uh, capings in here, so hey, it's not a standard square box plot. And here you can see that in this case, right, these two groups, although they look by eye to be relatively different, you can see that there's probably no statistical difference because the notch ends here and then it overlaps with this notch here, which is slightly outside of the box. So that means that there's not a lot of observations here. If you want to also add the observations, you can use the far width parameter and then it will scale the size or the, 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 the bulkiness of the box plot based on the number of observations in there. Histograms are again very 
commonly used. So R has a built-in histogram function called hist. Um, hist can be done using the frequency. Um, so you can say frequency is true or frequency is false. And in if you say set frequency to true, then it will show you the number or it will be based on the number of observations. And then here, because this is one which has been done by frequency is false, and then it, it, set, it gives you the density. So now the entire area of the plot will be one and the individual bars will be scaled based on the density. So the number of observations compared to the total number of observations. Um, of course, if you want to compare two groups which have very different numbers of observations, then you want to do this by the density and not the frequency, right? Because otherwise, if one group of measurements has a thousand measurements and another group only has like 50, and then of course the, the 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 thousand observations will be much higher because hey it will go like this group has a hundred observations uh, which is more than the total number of observations here so by setting setting it from uh, frequency to density you can compare two groups with each other which have a relatively big difference in the number of observations um, it has a parameter called breaks where you can set how many uh, where it should or how it should kind of group data. Um, so you can see here that I used it um, because here you can see that these groups are relative. So this is from 0 to 5, from 5 to 10, from 10 to 15 to 20. And so you have like um, breaks here, but here you see that the groups become much, much bigger. So you can set your own breaks and it will count how many observations you have in each of your kind of breakpoint sets. Um, so not every bar has to have the same width. You can have a group from 0 to 5 and then the next group going from 5 to 10 uh, and then the group after that going from 10 to 100. So hey, it is also possible to make histograms, for example, on a logarithmic scale where you just increase the size of the group every time by 10. Histogram has a plot parameter if you set the plot parameter to, to false it will not it will not draw the plot but it will return the value so it will return the number of observations in each of the groups which is sometimes very handy because if you want to kind of subdivide your data into different sections right so you want to say how many observations do i have from 0 to 20 and how many ups then you can use the return of the histogram function so the histogram returns something which you can put in a variable and you can use later if you don't want it to create the plot because you, you're not interested in the plot you're just interested in the statistics that it calculates um, then you just say plot is false and then it doesn't do the plot but it does do the calculation so it will give you for example the density so how many or what percentage of numbers are between 0 and 1 um, so all right so I already told you that you can use the image and the heat map function so the image function creates a grid of colored rectangles with colors corresponding to the values in Z so the, the more or less the, the measurements within the matrix um, so the heat map function is different it is less flexible but it has as an advantage that it does automatic clustering and it can use side colors so side colors means that for every individual um, for example you can say well this individual has gotten the high treatment and another individual has gotten low treatment right so you can use two or three colors to designate groups and then it will draw that at the side and generally what you want to see is this that you have a nice heat map where several groups are splitting out um, yeah, so that individuals who got the high dosage are grouping together and individuals which had the low dosage are also grouping together so I generally prefer the image function and um, I would say practice with the image function before you start using the heat map function um, to prevent some of these issues with the standard heat map function there's also a heat map dot two function so that's called heat map dot two um, and that is a slightly improved version of the standard heat map function but still it suffers from the same problems is that the um, the dendrograms on the side, um, they take up some of the margins, meaning that you can't really decide where, um, if you want to draw like additional lines in the plot, it's really difficult to figure that out using a heat map. It's very easy using an image function. So the image function, hey, the heat map function internally uses the image function as well. All right, so there's, um, if you want to make plots, right, then there's a whole bunch of additional parameters that you might want to set. For example, you want to say that the, the, the font label 
so I want to use a different font right I don't like the standard font or uh, the journal requires me to have plots and these plots should use uh, Ariel or Courier New or they should be in Wingdings, right? So R allows you to set the font of, for example, the labels, but also the font of the main and, and all of the other text that you use in the plot. So if you want to set or query graphical parameters, you can use the par function. So the par function, for example, here I use it to set some parameters. So I say that uh, the label font, so the, the, the font on the labels on the x-axis and the y-axis, should use font number 02. Of course, you can also specify it by name. So you can say font.lab is Ariel, and then it will use the Ariel font to do the plotting. Um, the font.axis is the, is the, is the um, um, oh no, the font.label is the, is the label, so that's the label of the x-axis and the label of the y-axis. The font.axis is actually the font used for the tick marks on the axis. Um, you have the cx.axis, which is the magnification. So here I say make them one, make them 50% bigger, and also make the labels 50% bigger. The, there's literally 150 or something options that you can set for plots to make them kind of adjustable. Um, yeah, so you have magnification, you have CRT, you have the family, the font, uh, the label, the last, the LTI, so the line types, the line thickness. Yeah, so there's a lot of things that you can set uh, using this par function. If you want to know what you can set, then you can just do in R question mark par. Yeah, so just type question mark, then do par, and then it will give you an overview of all of the different things that you can set. And it, I think it also has some images uh, to show you, for example, if you are dealing with things like uh, margin. So you have an inner margin, you have an outer margin, you have a max, which is the margin between two plots. Um, you have PCH, which is the point size, um, the, the type of the x-axis, if you should plot it or if you shouldn't plot it. So there's like 160 options. But and, um, can you also add another axis with par? No, that's what the axis function is for. So if you want to add a third axis, uh, opposite of the y-axis, then you can say axis 3, and then you can specify where you want to have your tick marks, and then you can also give labels to these tick marks. So if you want to um, change, for example, yeah, so instead of writing a million, you want to say one mio, then you can, you can use the axis function. So if you want to give an axis, then the axis function will do that. Um, the par is more like global plot, plot parameters, like um, how many DPI should my plot be? Um, what font family should I use? So those are general things which generally can't be set um, in the individual plot. So many options. If you want to know all of them, just do question mark par and it opens up a like five page help file or 10 page help file with all the different options that you can set with a description of how you can use it and what the default values are. All right, so how to plot. Um, so in R, generally when people use the R window, right, um, then you would just say plot something. But generally, if you want to use your plot, you're not wanting the plot to show up in R, but you want to have your plot, for example, in a PNG or a JPEG, right? You want to have a file on your hard drive. So generally, I first make my plots using just the plot function. When it works and I want to write it to the disk, then I use this structure. So the first thing that I do is say PNG, which opens up the PNG device. I give it a name, I give it a width and a height, and here I can also set the DPI, so the, the, the kind of resolution of the image. I then set up all of the parameters that I need, for example, the font size, the, the, the type of font, um, how big I want my labels to be, um, all of these parameters, so the global parameters. Um, then I create an empty plot, and this is what I generally do. So I create an empty plot, I give my own X and Y um, more or less axis, right? So here I say the X axis should run from 0 to 100, the Y axis should run from 0 to 1000, type equals none. If I would not specify type equals none, it would put a dot at 0, 0, and it would put a dot at 100, 1000. So by saying type equals none, I suppress the plotting of the values that I gave to the X and Y. It kind of, and because I told you that the plot function 
internally uses the points function to draw the points so by saying type equals none it doesn't call the point function so it will just say it creates an empty window and then I add the points or the lines or the arrows myself using either the points function or I use the arrow function or I use lines or rectangles so then I do my own kind of custom plot after I'm done then I say def.off and at this point it will save my PNG so it will hey, it will execute all of the commands and then it will save the PNG to disk so PNG just opens up the device it's very similar to when you read the text file right and you use a connection for it so if you use a, a connection then you have to close the connection in the end the same thing holds for plots so you open up a connection to a file then it streams the parameters into it the plot it creates the window and then you add the points the lines or the rectangles that you want to add and then when you say def off it closes the file and creates more or less the image so if you forget to do def off then you will have a file which is zero bytes and it won't have anything in there so only when you do def off will it save it to the hard drive so this is more or less my default for making plots if I want to create multiple plots, right, I want to have like a 4x4 four four plot, so I want to have in a single window, I want to have like four plots next to each other, um, I can use this uh, par function, right, which sets up global parameters. Here I'm saying MF row, so and this is just the way to tell R that I want to do multiple plots. Um, and in this case, I want to have four plots, uh, two rows, two columns. So MF row. This means that this is two rows and then the second one is the number of columns that I have. And then I can create four plots and these plots will go into the four empty slots that I defined here. So you can create multiple plots. Um, if you want to do it more uh, complex and you want to have um, like uh, a first plot being very big like taking the whole width of the of the picture and then the second plot only taking half of the width of the picture then I can use the layout function so the layout function allows you to come up with all kinds of weird um, structures on how you want your plots to look um, and the way that you do it is you say I create a matrix and in this matrix I give numbers so one means the first plot then zero means no plot and then two means second plot and then not, when I use the layout.show so it gives this matrix to the layout function and when I do layout.show nf um, then it shows my layout in the R window so what I define here and this is generally you s it's something that you draw on paper right so you you kind of make a little sketch of how you want your plot to look so I want to have like one plot on the top um, and I want to have like a little one on the side or I have one on the bottom and then hey you just define this as a matrix and in this case hey I just do two by two um, so hey one one means use the two top rows right so the, the both rows are filled with ones and then I do layout.show um, if you want I can give you an example of this that that something that might be then you can more visualize it in a way right let's do an example since we still have like a little bit left and I still have three slides left so we can do a little example so all right so let's go to the R window all right, so we have in the R window, so we made this plot, right? So let's let's just use this one. Um, so we're going to say, I'm going to create a matrix, right? And I want to have, I have three color channels, right? So let's make um, red, green, blue, right? So use the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, and then have like the first two channels on the top, and then an empty space, and then another one. So I'm going to say, I want a matrix. Inside of my matrix, I want to have one, two, zero and three and this is going to be a two by two matrix um, two by two matrix and I say by row um, by row equals true oh sorry small letter R right so now this is my matrix and now this matrix I'm going to use as my layout so I'm going to say layout and then I'm going to say ML for my layout and now I can do let me look it up so now I can do layout dot show um, ML right so now it says when I call plot once it will be here when I call it twice it will be here and when I call it the third time it will be here right so if I would now do um, plot 1 to 10 then you can see it will put it here 
the next one, for example, one to a hundred will be here, and the third one, one to a thousand, will go here. Right, so it just takes the matrix and interprets this. Um, so I can do even more complex, right? Because I can say, well, um, uh, imagine that I want to add like a, a, a little bit here, right? So I want to have like a, a, a new plot here on the side. Um, then I can say, well, I want to have a layout, which is, um, for example, one, one, right? Because I want to have more of a horizontal layout. Um, then I'm going to say two goes there. And then I want to say zero comma zero. And then the two plot goes here again, right? So if we look at this matrix, then, oh, um, this is of course a three by two, mat uh, two by three matrix, right? So now it looks one, one, two, two, zero, zero. So now I have the space for two, um, for two plots, right? So one, which will be horizontal. Um, and if I then say um, layout, all right, we won't do the next slide in Dutch then. So if I now say layout, call it ML, um, I can do the layout.show again. Um, and now it will show my layout and now you can see that the first plot is going to go here and the second plot is going to go here. If I think, well, this is too much space for the second one um, and I actually want to have like a third one or a third one here and a fourth one here, then of course I can just adjust my layout saying I want to have the third plot going here, then the fourth plot going here, um, but I want to increase the size of the first one by two for example and then I'm going to say these ones are two and this one is three and then this is five uh, so two by five right so um, if I would show you the matrix then the matrix would look like this so I have now four spots for the first plot then there's the second which will go across two columns and then I have plot number uh, oh no, that's, that, that's wrong. So this should be three, three, four, four. So I need to get rid of this and I want to make this one um, three and I want to make this one four, right? So this is more or less how I want it. So one plot in the, in the top here, then I want to have a very small plot here on the side and I want to have plot number three and plot number four go here. So now when I use the layout function, I can lay it out and then now it will notice that the layout of the window has changed. So now I can just say plot one to 10, right? So the first plot goes here, right? So this is, this is like four fifths of the whole plot. The second plot will go here Right, so that's that's like one fifth of the total thing, but across two columns. Um, the third plot. Um, let's just use this uh, nice uh, graphic that we had. Um, so just take the red channel here. Right, so the red channel goes here, and then I can take the green channel going to the other side and filling up the last spot um, and and put it here. Right, so using the layout function, I can be very, very flexible in, in where I want to have my plots and I can kind of create a single image. And it, it just functions by, if I have five rows, then it will just divide the entire plot window into five sections. And here I'm assigning four sections to this plot and only one section to this one, but this one goes across two columns. And of course I can use any size matrix. So in theory, I could do like 50 plots in a single window. Clear? Another example. Do we want to have more angry birds or are these? I think this is good enough, right? All right, so that's how you can use the layout function. And the layout.show just shows you the current layout that you have selected. Um, and so, and you can even use multiple layouts and store them in variables and reuse them. But um, and this is kind of the way that you want to set up multiplots. All right, back to the presentation. Um, all right, next slide in Dutch. Go for it. The apply function. So, um, na deze les hebben we opdrachten. En als je de opdrachten doet, um, dan um, zul je zien dat je een, uh, een heel aantal dingen moet berekenen, zoals het gemiddelde en standaard deviatie en dat soort dingen. Dus je kunt, je kunt een hele hoop tijd sparen door de apply functie te gebruiken. En als je de apply functie gebruikt, dan moet je niet vergeten dat de margin, dus de apply functie is gedefinieerd als x 
en dat is de matrix die we gebruiken. Dan hebben we de margin, which is 1, 2. Um, I never use, uh, ik gebruik nooit 1 en 2. En dan hebben we de fun en dat is de functie die we toe willen passen. He, zoals we, als, als we deze statement doen, dan zeggen we dus pas toe op mijn matrix over de kolommen de functie gemiddelde. En dit gaat je een hoop tijd sparen in, in de assignments. Dus he, gebruik, de, de, de assignments, uh, gebruik dus de apply functie als je dat kunt. Um, anders zul je het met een for loop of met een while loop moeten doen. Alright, so just quickly recap in, in English. So during the assignments you can save a lot of time coding effort by using the apply function. So the apply function, we already saw it, but um, it will save you a lot of time. Because otherwise you have to write a for loop or a while loop and then save and, and these kinds of things. But the apply function is going to help you during the assignments a lot. Um, so just as an example, we have apply, which works on a matrix called X. Then we have the margin. So in many of these assignments the margin will be one when we want to do something by the rows and the margin can be two when we want to do something by the different columns. Uh, the fun is the function that we want to apply and often these functions will be like mean or median or standard deviation um, and, and it's just for you guys to save time during the assignments try and use the apply function. Um, of course I would also advise If it works via the apply function, also try to do it using um, using a for loop, right? Just to practice your for loops um, or your while loops, just try and use them as well. Um, but the apply function will save you a lot of time and will create like really tiny one-liners, um, which otherwise would be for x in one to the number of columns take the column from the matrix, calculate the mean, store the mean in a variable, and these kinds of things. So you don't have to do that, you can do that automatically with the apply. All right, so um, we can also subset, right? So if we don't uh, want to have the mean calculated across all columns, but just a couple of columns, right? It might be that our matrix has a, a column which is not numeric, um, then we can say, subset so we have mdf which is our matrix right so mdf is just called the name of the matrix so take a subset of this matrix select columns one and column two and across this subset right so i'm just taking the whole matrix and scaling it down to the first two columns and then what i'm saying is apply to that to the columns the mean Right, and we can also use a filter, so get the means for a certain number of columns and use the column filter. So we can subset the matrix. I only want the column, I, I want the values in the column temperature to be below 25, and I only want to select column 1 and column 2. And then again, to this subset that I just made, apply to the columns the function mean. Right, so subset is your friend it really helps you. What does the 2 do? So the, the 2 is here the margin. So um, if you would say 1, it would do the, the, the average across the rows. And if you say 2, then it will do the mean across the columns. And I never use margin 1, 2, so just forget about this last line. But margin 1 means take this function and for each row do it, a margin of 2 means for every column do this. All right, so the subset function and the apply function are going to be really, really useful during the assignments um, because we are going to have taking, or you have to make some subsets and then you have to calculate things like, like means and medians and these kinds of things. All right, and that's it for today. So finished nicely in time, 12 minutes before five. Um, so if there are any questions, um, let me know. And um, next Tuesday um, at 3, we will again have our, um, no, the lecture next week does not take place because it's a holiday. Um, so we will be having the next lecture on the 20th, if I'm saying that correctly. So that's, um, yeah, 14 days from now. So that will be the 20th. There will be an assignments help section. So on Tuesday, because it's not a public holiday yet, um, on Tuesday at 3, um, we will have our weekly Zoom meeting um, for people that need help with the assignments. So if you want to get some help next week, um, 
I will have to see if we want to do it the week after as well, because other, then we have two Zoom help meetings for assignments. Um, but that's just up to you. If you you think that, oh, it will be good to have like two of these meetings to talk about the assignments. The assignments are really short this week, um, but um, I also uploaded um, additional assignments. So there are um, on the top of the Moodle, there's an uh, extra assignments or additional assignments. Um, Maybe do a different day for the week after. That is a very good idea, Testosaurus. That's why you have the little diamond in front of your name. Yeah, that's why you have the diamond. Um, that's a good idea. Um, I will, uh, uh, yeah, I will send around a mail then. So we will do it next week on Tuesday and then the week after. Um, General Gulag, what graphics package can you recommend? ggplot. None. Use R. Use what's available. Only then start learning more complex stuff to do ggplot. I, in my whole career, have never used ggplot. I think the syntax of ggplot is just completely confusing um, and I can't use it. I have colleagues who use it. So if you are, like I told you guys that there is an extra lecture or there's probably two spots for extra lectures at the end. If you wanna have a lecture about ggplot, that is possible, but I'm not gonna do it because I totally hate ggplot. And that's just my personal opinion. I don't know what an IS is and then with a layout and grouping factors and these kinds of things. I make my plots using plot, image, point, rectangle, arrow, these kinds of things. Will there be any lectures? Yes, there will be a lot of, so all the coming lectures won't really be about basic R programming anymore because you already know how to program. You can do a for loop, you can do an if statement, you can make a subset, you can load in your data, you can write out your data, all of the lectures that are coming. Um, so next lecture on the 20th will be about plots. So creating nice looking graphics for publication and PowerPoint. And after that, um, let me tell you what you're up for. Um, so let me go to my overview of the lectures. PPTX, um, our course, all right, so lecture number five on the 20th will be plots. Then there will be a whole lecture talking about statistical testing. Um, then there will be a lecture for me because I need to ask you guys some exam questions, which is about algorithms and functions. And I just love talking about recursion and these kinds of things. Um, then we will have uh, a regression lecture. So everything about regression and more. Um, and then there will be linear mixed models. So what is the difference between a random slope and a random intercept model and how to interpret the results from that. Um, there will be a lecture, lecture number 10 about creating an R package and getting rich off having other people using your code and, and being able to do that. Um, I have a lecture planned about common idioms, so common ways to do things in R, so stuff which comes back over and over again. And then there will be a your own, cho your own choice. So um, one person last, uh, last, the last assignment series said that he had a really nice data set concerning phishing or doing like electric fishing thing. So I, I just got the mail and I didn't read, but I will make one lecture for him because he gave me part of his data set or the whole data set. And um, I will just make a lecture about that. Um, so if there's anything that you want, for example, I want to know more about um, ggplot or I want to know more about block designs or I want to know more about um, how to create really professional look and graphics in R or I want to make little animated GIFs in R. You can actually make animated GIFs in R. Let me let me look that up for you guys because you, you might get a kick out of this. Um, I did this for a colleague. Um, I wrote a little simulation program which I call the cow culling simulator. Um, and um, let me look it up for you guys, which is just doing like weird stuff with R, right? Doing weird stuff with R is something that's always fun because you, it teaches you something. Um, and I hope that I have everything installed. Um, I hope so, because it uses emojis. <laughs> um, I'm 
pretty a fan of emojis so let's do it like this oh yeah I have the emojis installed um, so let's close the plot window difference in differences maybe or does it take too long how do you mean difference in differences because you can just use the diff function to get the differences and if you want the differences in the difference then then you use the diff function on the diff function um, so y you mean like I have a row of numbers like C one four six and eight nine uh, or something like that right these are numbers then I take the difference right so between one and four you have three and then if I want to have the difference of the difference then I just do the diff of the diff oh um, the diff of the diff which is the difference of the difference is that what you want? <laughs> Probably not. Um, anyway, let me show you the, the 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 weird stuff that you can do with R. I mean, the statistical technique if to find out whether there is causality. There is no statistical technique to find out if there is causality. Causality is not mathematically defined, so you can't you can't do that. Mathematic, well, that's not entirely true because I'm working in a field which is quantitative genetics, right? And Mendelian randomization does allow you to define causality. So, but if you're interested, then we can do a lecture about that. Like, I'm I'm more than more than willing to do that. Um, but then we probably want to have a vote on that because I don't think that everyone is into hardcore statistical genetics. Um, but yeah, we, we we could talk a little bit about causality. Um, it's actually part of my PhD thesis as well. I've been doing a lot of work on causality and doing causal networks from gene expression data and um, using like recombinant inbred lines and these kinds of things. Um, anyway, I just wanted to show you, and I hope this works actually too, um, because I don't, I never tried doing animated GIFs in R um, using. So I'm just going to make the window a little smaller so that we have the nice plotting window. Um, so fun stuff in R. So like I told you guys I made a cow killing culling simulator um, which simulates um, the effect on the genotype frequencies when the farmer starts selecting cows for things like milk production and to kind of show people that simulations in R are really fun and you can do all kinds of animated GIFs I decided to make something which is um, this. So um, this is also something that you can do in R. So here I'm just using emojis and I'm just using like refreshing the window um, to kind of make really fun animated GIFs um, in R. And you can do that. Like you can you can do anything in R that you want. And ggplot cannot do this, but R can. So like that's why I think R is superior to ggplot. So if there's anyone out there that wants to kind of challenge me and say well you can do this in ggplot as well show me how to do this in ggplot and I might consider learning it but uh, up until now no <laughs> if I can't use emojis and just make like little moving pictures and have cows get hit by by like bananas and stuff then um, I'm not interested in your plotting method um, but I, I do love these kinds of things like ooh, banana and then ah. and I made a lot of these like there's I have like a folder with like stupid crap that you can do with R. <laughs> anyway, uh, I will stop the recording for the people in Moodle.